Welcome to Empowered Returns, a show that surfaces forward-thinking real estate advice that investors and developers need to help them invest smarter and build better. Okay, welcome to uh, another episode of Empowered Returns. I'm P.T. Weinberg, founding partner at Charles Gate. Uh, flying solo today on the host side. Um, no Mike DeMella, but very, very excited to have uh, Eric Shinrock with us today. He's the uh, executive vice president of the Mount Vernon Company, um, one of the premier owner developers in in our in our area. Uh, been around close to forty years. We've got about sixteen hundred units, five hotels, some select commercial properties, and um, you know, really, really well respected and um, excellent company, and, and really fired up to to have Eric here. So welcome, man. Yeah, thanks and, for having me. Yeah, you bet. Um, all right. Well, I guess just kind of start up like just a little background on yourself and yeah. kind of how you landed at Mount Vernon and what your day to day looks like. And then we can kind of get into some nitty gritty. Sure. I uh, I was uh, surprised to hear we both kind of started in the same place at East Coast Realty in Austin. <laughs> I was uh, during college. I was uh, slinging rentals, started in the trenches and, and really got a taste for multifamily there, leasing apartments and hustling and doing deals. Uh, to pay the bills during college. And um, from there started buying my own little two and three family deals. And I was doing a lot of work for Mount Vernon, leasing their units and, and built up a relationship with uh, our, our chairman, Bruce, there. So as the need came up there for them to have an, a new project manager, I, I was excited to move to that side of the business. I had done the leasing thing during college. I tried a little bit of commercial brokerage um, and really figured out then that my my interest was in creating the product and improving the product, not so much in selling it. So when the opportunity um, presented itself, Bruce and I started talking about what 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 kind of role I could have at his company. We had we had built a good relationship through through the years on the leasing side. Um, and so about seven years ago, I started there as a project manager, supporting some of the new developments we were doing. Um, helping out analyzing acquisitions and sourcing deals. And over the years, kind of my role there grew. So now I'm, I'm leading our acquisitions, our new developments, and our operations team. Awesome. Um, cool. So we've, we've built a few great buildings over the last few years. We're permitting some more. Um, and yeah. Very transactional. So we're always, always looking for new deals and opportunities, mostly around Boston, but we're starting to spread our wings and, and look further abroad. Too. Cool. Cool. I'm psyched to get into some of the yeah. the uh, details and in the weeds on some of those projects yeah. and whatnot. Want to take it back a step, uh, fellow Eagle? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I was yep. at BC and I, I couldn't pay the room and board waiting tables. So yeah. Some some broker I was looking at apartments with sold me on the idea of getting a real estate license. And oh, that's funny. The rest that's, is history. That's, I don't, that's God literally. Knows what I it was what we were joking <laughs> when we had our you know when we were talking about uh, you know prepping for today that I have like almost identical story where. The kid who rented us our apartment uh, just came to me one day in a, you know one of the buildings at BC, and he's like, "I hate this job. I went to quit." And and they said, "I need a replacement. I think you'd be pretty good at this." <laughs> and so that that was my sophomore year. I got licensed. Sales pitch. Le, 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 <laughs> was, was, yeah, yeah. Um, got licensed over Christmas break, and 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 kind of did it through my last three years of school. I, I always say, and we were joking about this before. I don't think there's a better job when you're in college, just in general, like no. just you know socially, financially. Um, and then if you, you know, as you've chosen to do, and I've chosen to do, if you're going to stay in this industry, is there, a, it, I, I can't think of a better way to kind of cut your teeth than grinding out rentals in Austin, Brighton, Brookline, or any of these sort of, you know, mixed your student, young professional markets. I mean, just such a great way to kind of set your foundation. Um, I couldn't agree more. And I, to this day, I use a lot of what I learned there as far as what, what those tenants are looking for. We're in the multifamily game. We're right. renting to those same types of young professionals, grad students, young families. Th that's who we build our product for today. And knowing what they're looking for and what their expectations are and just knowing the intricacies of the neighborhoods that we build in. Right. We're primarily focused on Austin Brighton. We own all throughout the city, so Somerville, Cambridge as well. But our new development is almost exclusively been in Austin and Brighton. So knowing that market like the back of my hand and knowing what our, our end user is looking for has, has really proven beneficial. And just understanding the leasing side of the business, especially in a market like Boston, that, that's really unique. Yeah, it's, totally. Uh, yep. Leasing here is based on a brokerage community. It's yeah. 
very rare, except in these larger third party managed buildings to do most of your leasing in house. Yeah. So knowing how to work with the brokers and, and take their feedback and, and appreciate them, I think it has served us well. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, um, I guess, you know, great background and, and sort of a, a good sort of setting to how the, the story starts and in, in your, your professional trajectory, but, um, kind of going specifically to Mount Vernon, right? Like you guys yeah. are known as a premier operator, right? And it was yeah. that same way, literally 24 years ago when I was renting apartments, it was like you walked into a Mount Vernon building and it just looked different. It felt different. And, you know, just like you started because you were cranking out all their rentals and that's how you formulated your yeah. relationship with Bruce. Like I was kind of the same thing, you know, probably 10 years earlier, which is like, you know, I was renting 20 of those a, a, a summer, 30 of those yeah. a summer, whatever it was. So what's the high level approach from a organizational level at Mount Vernon? Like, can you give a handful of examples of, you know, what differentiates your properties, both on the new development side, and you guys have sure. had some pretty high profile new developments of late, as you mentioned, you know, Radius and Art House being top of mind, um, and also the legacy product, which again, in a neighborhood that is, you know, very, has a continuity of vintage in its architectural elements, right? It's buildings are all circa 1900 to 1920 and kind of look the same. And, and again, you, you go into a Mount Vernon b building and it just sort of evokes this different visceral reaction to like, you know, sends a quality signal, like I got to rent this. Right. And that's why it was kind of, yeah. you know, pretty easy to rent those. So how do you guys approach that organizationally? And, and what are again, a, a few of the key things that you guys, you know, um, really hone in on to, to make sure that perception comes out? Yeah, well, I think it starts with like a philosophy that we want every unit we own to be a unit we would personally be willing to live in. Everything should be up to that standard. Cool. Okay. And you alluded to it, but we have two sides to our business. We have the new development where we're building, obviously, ground up, more luxury type product in in slightly more affordable markets. We're not building downtown, but there's it's still new product and it still garners a premium rent for its neighborhood. Um, but the, the bulk of our portfolio historically has been legacy buildings that are 100, 125 years old. And we still like to be the leader in that product type. So we want to be the nicest legacy building in each neighborhood we're in. So it really, our perspective is that we are, we're providing a product to a customer. Our renter, our tenant is our customer, and we need to meet their needs and also exceed them if we want them to stay and renew and recommend us to their friends and colleagues. So it really, I think it all starts with that philosophy that we are going to deliver a product that we're proud of and that we want to, we ourselves would be happy living in. And then that we recognize who our customer is and what we need to do to make them happy and to keep them there. And it really just picking up the phone and not sending people to an answering service. I mean, it's small things that I, a lot of, I think property managers and landlords take for granted, but tenants really value. Yeah. Um, so we've always really focused on the customer service side of the business. And that's been the philosophy since Bruce first like founded the company and he's instilled it in all of our property managers, as well as everybody at the corporate level. We're really focused on exceeding our customers, our renters, uh, expectations. And we also are willing to, uh, trade some rate for, Occupancy. We, right. want, we want our buildings 100% occupied. We maintain them in, in a way that allows us to do that and to be the best in class in each of our neighborhoods. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that was always something that, you know, again, it, it's it's funny how these, you know, uh, I guess philosophies just haven't really changed. And, and that's, yeah. you know, enabled you guys to build such a sustainable and, and reputable business. But you know, it was always the same thing. Like you'd leave 50 or 75 bucks on the table a month to get the better tenant or to get the, you know, the immediate occupancy or whatever sure. it was. And, um, you know, I guess sort of, you know, I, I, I kind of start a little general and then we'll get back into some of the specific stuff you've been working on. But, um, you know, who's been your, your biggest, you know, mentor in, in your career to date? I've had two. Um, one, I think we, we kind of, uh, have in common Well, we both know John Conroy, the first guy that hired me in real yeah, estate yeah, at East coast yeah. realty. He and I actually met at a BC tailgate, like the weekend after I got my real estate license and I never looked anywhere else, never turned, uh, never had a second thought. Um, so that got me into the game. And then, uh, really my, my mentor over the last decade has been Bruce personally. Yeah. Uh, he t took me under his wing at Mount Vernon. 
um, gave me a chance to work on these really high level projects and um, to, to, to participate in that, the development process and finding us new deals. And that he's, he's been a great mentor all along. Yeah. So I think that's a good segue when you talk about Bruce and, and obviously you think Mount Vernon um, and, and um, you know, he's the founder is clearly the, you know, the guy that you, that you think of, but I, you know, I think when I think of the company, I think of how immersed you guys have been in, in the communities in which you have your buildings and, yeah. you know, in a lot of ways, how that has correlated to your ability to entitle projects and, you know, get some of these buildings approved in neighborhoods like Alston Brighton that historically didn't have projects the size of Radius or the yep. size of Art House. And can you share examples of how you've kind of incorporated, you know, that that community based approach and the community feedback into your projects and, you know, kind of you know, maybe a couple like outside the box examples of how you sort of coalesced the feedback you got from the community or the approach you took with the community and and, and how that translated into the end result for a building. Yeah, well, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. We've been in Alston and Brighton for 40 years almost, and we have a great relationship with the community groups, with our neighbors. Um, I mean, it starts with how we maintain our buildings and, and the, the way we manage. And um, I think we've, we've earned that. Um, but also, it, it, it's it's been a process. It's it's hard to entitle anything in Boston, um, and uh, for better and worse, the, the neighbors have things that they want out of a project or things they don't want to happen. And we've always been a willing partner, I think, and been open to having those discussions and to making concessions and making changes. And when you follow through with what you say you're going to do on one project, they they give you some credit on the next one, and and at least you have the benefit of trust. So yeah, Art House is a great example of where we worked with the community to come up with a product that both suited our goals for the site and provided something to the community that wasn't there before and was an enduring benefit. Um, branding and design has always been a huge component of our new developments. Um, I think it's often overlooked and there's a lot of merchant built product that you could, you could plop it down in any city in the US and it would look the same. We really have focused on trying to build something that's unique and true to the neighborhood, whether it was the Green District in Austin, which was a very sustainable design at that time and, and something that hadn't been done in this area at all, um, or Art House just up the road, which we just completed uh, a year and a half ago. In that case, we had we had designed in a retail space on the ground floor. We're on a busy street with a lot of good foot traffic in a, in a commercial corridor. Um, obviously, there was economic value to having a, a retail tenant in there paying rent. But as the identity of the building started to come together around this artistic heritage in Alston, Alston's named after Washington Alston, who was a great painter. Um, there's obviously a, a lot of uh, music based in Alston. There has been for a long time. Um, and even to this day, it's a haven for the arts community in the city because it has relatively affordable rents. It has rehearsal spaces. It has some arts facilities. So that brand identity came early on in the process and as we talked with the community about what was lacking and what the community used to be and what they wanted to be in the future it it became clear that having that art component accessible to them as well was important so we pivoted and what was a, a revenue generating retail space became a public art gallery. Right. We partnered with a great local nonprofit, um, Unbound Visual Arts, who was already serving the Austin Brighton artist community. They work pretty much exclusively with artists in that neighborhood. And we were able to give them this space to promote the artist's work, hold shows, have an open gallery that the, the building residents as well as the community can come into and enjoy different artwork. It's, it's constantly changing buy art um and that was a win-win in our eyes it, it really it was it gave back to the community it improved the amenity package for our residents and it it, it really checked a lot of boxes yeah yeah no that 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 space is cool <laughs> that yeah. space is really cool yeah. um so can you share kind of any lessons that you learned like from that project or or other past projects and how that's influenced the way maybe you're approaching any of the stuff you're working on now and what are you working on now as far as, you know, the next radius, the next art house and, and kind of what, sure. what, you know, and then I think we should talk a little bit more about, um, 
after after we hear what that is, like what are the biggest challenges to get yeah, those absolutely. projects to fruition, right? Because I think that's a big thing that we're seeing now is, you know, being able to actually go in and and execute projects for a variety of reasons. But I think maybe from the permitting and entitlement side, what do you guys have in your pipeline and yeah. how are you approaching it and 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 how are you using things things that you learned from those other bigger projects that you've done to to kind of influence how you're how you're going about it. Yeah. So the the first thing that comes to mind is that art house. It's it, it was it's tight site, and the community would only let us build so much. So we only have seventy two units there. Mm -hmm. And what we found compared to we typically build a hundred to two hundred units. We found a nice niche where it's a, a good size to manage. It is a, a reasonable um, unit count for spreading out operating expenses, but it's not so large that we don't know the tenants. That we don't have a relationship with them and that we have a, a huge um, lease up risk um, art house is on the small end it's 72 units and right. we're the operating expenses there's really not a lot of units to spread that out over so i think one of the takeaways from that is that there's there is a minimum unit size that you can offer a fully amenitized building at and still manage operating expenses um, so part of what we did well in the green district is we built a a grouping of three buildings that added up to a few hundred units and there's there's a lot of uh efficiency to managing a larger portfolio in close proximity like that right um what we built at uh radius a couple of years earlier was uh, 132 units but at the same time we were able to uh tie up the site next door which is 30 leo birmingham parkway we just got through the permitting process on that last month. We got our ZBA approval, which is pretty much the final step. So we'll be able to build another 117 units there. And combined with Radius Next Door, we'll realize some of those operational efficiencies that you get when you're over that 150 unit um, number. Um, so 30 Leo took a lot longer to permit than things have in the past. Um, so that was definitely a challenge and largely out of our control COVID, but as well as the changing administration right. in the city yeah, when, right. when yeah. Marty left yeah. for DC. Um, so definitely got slowed down a lot there and has made it really challenging by the time we're coming out with entitlements. Now the interest rate environment has changed. Construction costs are up significantly. So it's a really challenging time to build. And I think we won't be the only ones that have to reassess whether things that are already entitled are can be built in the near term. Yeah, and, um, and I think that's a massive problem in in our market, and yeah. is going to continue to be a massive problem because you know I think this is a good segue into that question I sort of teased before. But like the biggest challenges right now for you know the development industry, you know locally and really probably on a macro level too, of course, but especially here with construction costs. And with rates and you know like you said you guys got entitled what percentage affordable are you on we are 17 percent affordable there okay. at a range of amis though so okay uh, the community has been pushing for 20 25 percent even and right then, um we were able to balance that uh, a slightly lower percentage with uh, a deeper affordability and okay. some at higher affordability yeah so often what comes out of the community meetings is not a clear directive it's a lot of conflicting perspectives right so some people just want a higher percentage of affordability that they're not as sensitive to the mi yep. some people want workforce units they say there's a gap between people who qualify for 70% AMI and market rent. So we we need some units at 100, 120. And then there's other people that want really deep affordability that want you to go down to 50. So uh, affordability is just one example, but a lot of the community process is managing these this conflicting input that you get and yeah. trying to make everybody feel like they're getting some of what they asked for. And so we ended up there balancing a lot of different requests on the affordability front specifically we ended up at 17 percent overall but we have a range from 50 percent ami up to 110. okay um so we felt like it was a good outcome for everybody yeah um, yeah, and yeah totally the, so just digging into that one a little deeper like yeah. is there a specific so you go to you have a community meeting right you get yeah. to your point and i've been in a lot of those community meetings you get a lot of stakeholders a lot of conflicting uh, requests for, you know, to, yeah. to simplify it, right? Like that's basically, and you know, you're going to have to come back to get 
their approval. So you're going to have to figure out how to take that feedback and, and work it into your plan. That still makes the project economically feasible for you, but also, you know, alleviate some of the concerns that are voiced that meeting. Like, if you're giving a, a developer advice who's entitling something, right, and you go to a meeting and you get these conflicting things, what what do you guys do? How do you distill those comments and come up with the strategy to come back for round two at that meeting, right? Like, you know, I, it sounds like that was a good solution there. And, and a lot of people might, you know, some might may know what AMI is and, and how that works, but you know, we're not, not going to go down that rabbit hole, but basically you see a lot of projects that really it's only like 80, 90 and a and, and hundred percent AMIs. So what you guys did is you guys went down all the way to 50 AMI, right? To try to keep the over, you know, and, and the overall affordability was at 17% versus maybe going at 20% affordable on the number of units, all at 80 to 100 AMI. You guys were able to say, all right, hey, look, why don't we come back and, and we'll, we'll propose 17%, but we're going to offer some some deeper discounted units at 50, 60, 70% AMI. Yeah. Is that basically what you did? Yeah, there? that's yeah. how that worked. And okay. I think on the, yes, you're always coming out, whether it's affordability or parking or density, there is, in almost every case, you have multiple people on both sides of the issue. There's people that want less parking because they want to discourage car ownership and driving for the climate benefits and, and other reasons. There's people that want more parking because they don't want to see a single new car parking on the street they've lived on for right. a long time. Right, right, right. And you you can't do both of those things. I yeah. mean, in, in some cases, the city has a position that can help uh, help you land. Um, in, in a lot of cases, the BPDA has parking maximums so you have you have that to to point to a, a, as a rationale for where you are in parking, um, but it, the, the, the easy part of quantifying the conflicting input from the community is the economics. I mean, you can do that pretty quickly, right? But right, figuring out which which uh, which requests to take over another it is tricky, and that, that's why there's a series of meetings. I think. I mean, we have dozens of meetings for each project we're entitling, especially large projects. Um, so we've, we've found success in, in trying to meet multiple times and propose various different solutions. Um, and often the, the, the leaders of the community groups are, are, are helpful in, in getting their groups to coalesce around certain issues and prioritize. Right. Yeah. That's um, what so I was say, yeah. back to your, yeah. your point earlier about how long we've been in the communities in which we build having those longstanding relationships with the community groups and being able to talk to them um, is, is really helpful in resolving those conflicting requests from the community. Nice. Um, and so, you know, obviously Mount Vernon is kind of your, your, that's your primary role. Yeah. But one thing that, you know, you had referenced earlier when you were giving us your background is you started doing some, you know, uh, some buying of some units yourself and developing units of yourself. How do you, you know, how much of that do you do? And like, yeah. what type of stuff do you do? And then how do you kind of take, and is there a real, um, you know, kind of relationship between the, the principles that you employ on sort of the Mount Vernon level, right? On the bigger multifamily level and, and bring that into some of the smaller scale development and ownership yeah. and operating that you do. You know, a lot of people that are in our audience, right, are, are, walking that line as well, where they're, you know, doing, um, doing things, you know, on a, on a corporate level, but then yep. they're also doing things on a, on a more, um, you know, private level for lack sure. of a better way to put it. Right. And so how much of that are you doing? What are you up to? You got anything exciting yeah. going on? Sure. And again, how do you sort of utilize what you're taking out of your Mount Vernon day to day into that, into that world? Yeah. Um, so before I started with Mount Vernon, when I when I had the kind of realization that brokerage wasn't where I was going to spend my career yeah. and that I wanted to be investing and developing and building, I started buying, I bought a three family in JP and I worked another year to be able to renovate it. And then I was able to sell that and turn it into two, three families and just do the, the classic, uh, raise the value, tap your equity through a refi or a sale and increase your unit count. So I, I'm doing a, a couple of deals a year that way. My um, vast majority of my time is focused on larger projects with Mount Vernon, but I yeah. try to keep keep growing my portfolio on the side steadily. Um, and I've definitely been able to apply a lot of the principles I learned 
working in Mount Vernon and developing larger buildings to the smaller the smaller sites as far as how you deal with tenants, how you operate, um, and what what kinds of um, improvements in the value add buildings are are worthwhile. What what tenants value? I mean, historically, a lot of our our business has been doing value add deals, buying older buildings, right. improving units, getting rents up to what they're worth, and um, and then using the increased value of the building to do more deals. That's a formula that a lot of guys use. It's it's a tested formula. You you can add value to real estate, and then you can use that newly created value to to acquire more real estate. Um, but I think really the, the the most important thing that that I have taken is the perspective that your your tenant is your customer and yeah. you have to serve them well or they have other options. Yeah. Um, you're going to have higher turnover. You're not going to get people to renew. Um, so th that's definitely one of the, one of the biggest lessons that I've applied on both sides. So um, it, it was, it's funny. I actually remember this, like, you know, what do you think is really important? Like, right. I, on value add, like you said, that's kind of been the bread and butter for Mount Vernon and you're taking it on a smaller scale to the stuff you're doing. And, you know, I'm going way in the way back machine here, but like, I remember like, you know, dishwashers were like a huge needle mover back, yeah. you know, for a rental property back in like the early 2000s, you know what I mean? But like the Mount Vernon product, actually, a lot of times I felt like didn't have it, but everything else was so much nicer and cleaner that like people got over it. That's right. Funny. So like, remember that? yeah, I totally remember <laughs> that. And I don't know why I'm thinking about it now, but I guess that's sort of a, you know, just a, again, an old school example, yeah. but can you give me some, some examples of like what in your current properties, either on the legacy side or on the new, new development yeah. side, like what's kind of overrated, underrated as far as like what you're, what you guys are putting into buildings or when you're sure. sprucing up a, a 1920s building, right? Like what are you yeah. doing now, you know, differently versus what you might've been doing 10 years ago and, you know, what kind of things are you focusing on? as sort of the, um, you know, the engine to, to, to drive that value add in, in, in your, in both, both, uh, pro, um, product segments really, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, this isn't groundbreaking, but we, we focus on common areas first because okay. you improve the common area, you're, you're improving the value of every unit, you're improving the experience of every tenant. Mm -hmm. So we, we always make sure our common areas, our, our hallways, our entries are in t a top condition. Yep. We've spent a lot of time over the last 10 years maximizing amenity spaces that were underutilized in basements and otherwise. So we've added gyms in a lot of places. Oh, nice. Okay. Every resident survey we would do, the most requested or criticized feature is laundry availability Yeah. or downtime. So we've spent a lot of time improving laundry rooms, adding laundry machines. We're looking more and more into adding more laundry in unit, which has its challenges in older buildings. Right. But it definitely has a, a great impact on rent. We like common area improvements because they touch every unit and they improve everybody's life. Um, it's funny you, you said dishwashers because that's something that we will not leave out of a renovation nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants it. I think once you've lived with one, you can't go back. Yeah, totally, totally, um, totally. It is a challenge though because yeah. a lot of our legacy buildings have tiny, tiny kitchens. kitchens. They're very right. small units. Yeah. So where do you fit it? Yeah, but yeah. we're making it work. Um, <laughs> And then I think in the in the newer buildings, like we talked about earlier, like branding and having a unique identity for a building has proved really important for us and for our tenants. And we yeah. saw that at Art House. People wanted to live there because it was authentic in the branding, in the in the artistic identity. We had unique artwork all throughout it, a lot of locally created pieces. Um, and we, we had the gallery run by a local operator. We had a really artistic architectural design on the outside. And I think those, one of the things that we really prioritize is good design. Yeah. Because so often it's easier to do what everybody else is doing or take a cookie cutter approach. We really find that you get paid for better design. So we spend a lot of time we have great design partners and we spend a lot of time re refining our designs, both in the new buildings and the old, um, yeah. to, to get to something that's not cookie cutter and has its own uh, identity. Yeah. I mean, I think that that branding is so critical, right? And, that, and honestly, 
yeah, no Charles Gay plug, I guess, but like that's a big thing that we've been able to do, you know, on our new development sales and marketing with a lot of our projects is, you know, taking these sort of mid-market buildings, giving them an identity, giving them a brand that resonates and tells a story yeah. and has really been able to, you know, drive some of that pricing that, you know, you've seen us accomplish in, in Alston Brighton, like on the condo side where, yeah. you know, no one thought that was a 900 bucks a square foot market in 2018 or an 1100 yeah you know, $1,200 square foot market now. Sure. And um, that's one thing I, I definitely have admired about, you know, you, you talked about the green district. I mean, that's a great example of that. Right. Yep. And then radius. I mean, that's a super, like, it's on a radius, the buildings designed that way. Yep. And I do think that the, the branding and the design need to tie. And I think that there's so often when, when it feels inauthentic on the branding side, yeah, it's because it doesn't relate to anything, you know, with the actual physical property. And like, you know, like radius is you look at the exterior design, like, oh, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out how that sort of worked. Right. right? And then right. art house with, you know, the visibility of that public art gallery on that, on that street level. And, um, and what other design features in that building? I know you said the common area. There's a big yeah, mural yeah, on yeah, the front yeah, of the building. Yeah, it's, right. it's really, a, that's an expensive exterior. It's yeah. very articulated. There's yeah. a lot of metal panel. Yeah. Um, so we don't cut corners on those things, no. but we do find that they're, you get a return on them. Oh yeah. People totally. value it. Yeah. it. It's even a layman can look at the box across the street and know that that's a different product than, than something that looks unique and yeah. is eye catching. And yeah. I think the, the branding and the design strategies we use on the new developments have translated really well to our legacy portfolio and um, value add putting a name on a building, even if it's older and branding around that name, we get people that call us just because they see that that building's called the matrix. Right. And they reference that they don't know what street it's on, but they've driven by the sign. It has, it has a, a nice facade and they, they're curious just based on it having an identity. That's not just an address. Yeah. We're, uh, we're very much on board with, how much design can differentiate. And it's funny because, yeah. you know, some other guests we've had and other clients that we've had, it, it's, um, I don't think it's any coincidence, the level of success that a lot of the projects have had for those who are design focused and really, you know, understand the importance of curb appeal, first impression that again, that initial kind of emotional reaction when you to your point, when you walk into a, even a, even the old standard 120 year old brownstone, yeah. just you walk into the clean hallways and the nice carpet and the nice paint and some wainscoting or molding or, you know, a nicer light fixture. Like it just resonates in a way that just enables you to drive value. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and I, mean, I think the evidence of that yeah. for us has always been in the new developments, how quickly we lease up. Right. We opened art house in the part of COVID yeah, in the winter, yep. it was 90% pre-lease before we opened and the last 10% was done within a month. Yeah. So yeah. that was probably the worst time in my career to be leasing up a building. And we were able to get that done largely because of the story right? and the, the unique feel of the building, yeah. I, I think. Yeah, I know. I think that's an awesome example. So, all right. Like, you know, I think some awesome nuggets as far as your career and you know, some of Mount Vernon's kind of specific successes and everything else. Um, so I guess, you know, just kind of some more dialing it back a little bit to a couple of general questions yeah. to wrap up. But how are you going about like finding deals these days and and how hard is it to find them and, and how are you sourcing them yeah. and how are you underwriting them? What are you, what are you looking at right now? And, you know, I guess sort of what are you seeing in the market, you know, both right now and what are you kind of forecasting for for 2023 and, and and into 24 we're being cautious right now i mean there's a huge bid ask spread i think between what sellers are looking for and what things are really worth in today's environment so it's yeah. it's it's hard to transact it is yep. um yep so we're we're building a war chest and we're we're looking for opportunities um through our relationships we do a lot of direct outreach we have some great brokerage partners and what we're doing um, beyond that is is looking further afield. I mean, we have to look outside of the city to get reasonable yield and and some better opportunities. So we're doing that. Uh, we're we're working on some things in New Hampshire uh, with a partner. 
Um, we've been exploring a, a bunch of other markets recently. Um, but not having time pressure and, and being able to be a little bit more picky and and underwrite things a little more conservatively, uh, given where we feel like the economy is going in the next year. It's also given us some time to redouble our efforts on our operations and focus on kind of optimizing how we run our existing portfolio. Yeah. So I think our approach right now, it's cautious, but we do feel there's going to be some opportunities that come out of all the all the changes that are happening right now. Um, so we are we're looking at a lot of deals, but not a lot of penciling. Right. And in the meantime, we 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 are doing a lot of things to reduce our operating expenses as as inflation takes everything up, and to improve the existing buildings and make sure that we're we're best positioned if if there is uh, another spike in vacancy or if. if if tenants are reconsidering their options as, as rent increases, kind of stabilize. So, I, over the next year, personally, I think we're gonna we're gonna see rent stabilize. I don't think they're gonna drop drastically, but yeah. I, I don't. They're obviously not gonna go up at the clip that they have been. Hundred percent. That right. was. Yeah. I think I, I read if, if rents had increased throughout COVID at four percent a year, they'd be right where they are now. So right. I think what we saw over the last year, this dramatic jump. It looks like a huge percentage year over year, but that was really just catch up. Right. For right, the, right, right. The for that three frozen years year, where things yeah, didn't yeah, really 21 grow. was exactly. sort of like a, So we caught up yeah. to where we would have trended anyway. Yeah. And yeah. I don't think we're, maybe we'll maybe we'll get plus or minus two or three percent, but I don't I don't think we're gonna see significant rent decreases. I'm there may be opportunities, especially on the in the mid market and smaller stuff where people are coming out of loans and either have to come up with a lot of cash or sell. Um, so we're, we're, we're prepared for those opportunities. In the meantime, we're really just focusing on looking at some new markets where there might be less sophisticated competition and yeah. more opportunity okay. for growth and improving what we already own, yeah. be it through renovations of common areas, adding amenities, um, unit renovations, and just preserving the tenant base that we have. I think what we saw in COVID was a lot of people are renters by choice. They when when they didn't have an income or didn't need to be local they moved in with a roommate or they moved home or they moved to a different city and if the economy heads in the wrong direction next year more if there's more layoffs people could easily go back that way so we want to ensure that the residents we do have are happy that we're getting that they're referring their friends that we're maintaining 100 percent occupancy which is i think a little bit of, Maybe not controversial, but it's not the approach most people take. Right. We want 100% occupancy, and we're whereas I think the traditional thinking is you maximize income and accept some occupancy. We've had a lot of success by maximizing occupancy, keeping tenants happy, and being willing to accept that trade-off that we're gonna we're gonna get great tenants. They're going to be happy and they're going to be less likely to move. We're going to have to turn fewer units. Um, so, I mean, that's always been the strategy, but that's yeah. certainly okay. what we're focused on. So you may have just answered the question I was about to ask you, but it, it, maybe you can give me one more example. What's, what's, what's one thing about, you know, the way you guys approach things that no one agrees with you about? I don't know if it's no one, but I right. think that's it. Yeah. Like okay. most uh, most managers are mod they're they're accepting a certain percentage of vacancy, and then they want to maximize their income beyond that. Okay. We're willing to trade a little bit of uh, rate for occupancy and quality of tenants and length of tenancy, and if our tenants are loyal to us, we're loyal to them, and we really just focus on, on keeping people yeah and keeping yeah. them happy and it's it's been it's been the strategy since before I, I joined the company and it's proved really successful um of course you can always push people for another dollar but then they're going to treat you the same way and they're going to chase concessions right and, right yeah no really well said so uh just a couple more to wrap up yeah what uh what would you tell your younger self now that you've got you know these plus or minus you know close 10 years under your belt here doing what you're doing what would you tell your younger self about your current role that maybe you wouldn't have thought going in well the first thing that came to mind before you said about my current role was i if it was if i was just talking to my younger self i'd tell myself to buy more <laughs> i totally was gonna say the same thing buy, more, buy now. more real estate yeah, yeah. Um, i know 
Uh. About my current role, I think what I didn't realize when I aspired to be a developer was how much of it is relationships with the community. Nothing gets built in Boston without variances. So it's really a community process to build anything new of substance. You ha you're going through a, a community and a political process and you have to be willing to engage and to subject yourself to criticism because developers don't have a great rap. I mean, right. we're you guys we're, do, which is no, really like, it, it, it's an outlier, man. Like, uh, like that, all, that's generous. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to pump your no, tires no, here. Like just Mount Vernon you know, is hearing, fortunate to have yeah. a really great reputation, yeah. but as a whole, everybody agrees that we need more housing. Right. But the people that are in the business of providing it, yeah. and I don't think there's anything wrong with them getting compensated to, to create housing, but there's a lot of negativity around development. Yeah, and I don't oh, think, 100 I think yeah. that was not something I was fully aware of going into it. Right. You know, you have to be willing to engage and get criticized and take the feedback and make changes or nothing is going to get built. Um, yeah. And you, it's, a, it's a long process. It's a slog. You know, a development in this city, it could take two or three years to get permitted and then another two to build. Um, so it's just, it's a really long process. And um, yeah, I, th I think that's it. Just like the, the thing that I didn't realize when I started was how much of a community driven process development is and how much uh resistance there is yeah to to doing something that everybody agrees we, they, we, need, we need right we need more yeah, housing but it's over yeah. their head we, right one of the main solutions to the housing crisis is creating more housing right more yep. supply 100 yeah, percent. but the barrier I, one of the key things i didn't realize when i started was the barriers to creating more housing to, right to developing um buildings and how strong and entrenched they are um and I think over the last few years, in a lot of ways, it's it's only gotten harder. Right. Um, there's a lot of good causes that make it harder and harder to build, be it increased affordability requirements, which I think we can all agree affordable housing is a great cause. Uh, but it a, a project can only bear so much before it doesn't make sense. Right. Um, increased sustainability requirements. Another example. Great cause. Uh, but if our goal is housing production, we would have to balance the two because sustainable measures in a building adds significantly to costs. Um, so there's a lot of um, headwinds that we're up against while interest rates are increasing, while construction costs are increasing. And it's just, there's a lot of balancing. Like we talked about in the community meetings when you're getting conflicting input, there's also um, balancing of these other goals that often conflict, if not with each other, at least with the goal of creating more housing and being able to offer it at a, at a when it costs you four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars to build one apartment, you you have to get a certain rent or you you can't build that apartment. Right. What's motivating you right now? What do you see? this year for Mount Vernon yeah. and, and for you personally. And I think we can wrap up there. Um, so what motivates me today is, is the process. I mean, the, the, the beauty of real estate is that you get to stand in it. You get to see it and touch it and see it transform. For me, that's why I love this business and what's motivating me today and, and into the future. I want to keep building things. I want to keep improving existing buildings and providing good places for people to live. Um, at Mount Vernon, where we, we just got 30 Leo in, entitled, we're hopeful that we'll be able to find a way to, to get that going soon. Um, obviously, it's challenging with construction costs and interest rates where they where they are. Um, and then on on the personal side, I'm, I, my goal next year is to double my unit count. Hopefully, there's some opportunities to do that. Um, and yeah, just fight another year. Awesome. Well, it's been great, great having you. I mean, again, just a huge fan uh, of you personally, of Thanks. of Mount Vernon, you know, uh, really honored that we got to partner with you on some level on the yeah. uh, condo side at Art House. And uh, where can people find you if they if they want to find you online, social media, LinkedIn? Uh, yeah, on LinkedIn, just Eric Shinrock on LinkedIn. You'll find okay. me there. 
Awesome. All right. Well, thanks again for coming in, man. It was enjoyable. Thanks for having me. Yeah. It was a blast. All right. Awesome. Thank you for listening to another episode of Empowered Returns. If you're a forward-thinking real estate investor or developer looking for actionable advice that will help you generate market-beating returns, make sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast fix. I'm Mike DeMello with Charles Gate, and I'd love to connect on LinkedIn and further the conversation for any specific questions you may have. Thank you for listening.